thank you all so much for coming. I'm Julia Bryan Wilson, Professor of Modern and Contemporary Art in the History of Art Department and Director of the Arts Research Center, which is a think tank for arts on uh, campus and beyond. This is our first event for the year and the kickoff for a series of conversations, workshops, and dialogues that will focus on how arts research takes many shapes including alternative or experimental formats that do not always culminate in typical academic scholarship, but are often deeply rigorous and scholarly. And tonight I have invited two curators, Miguel Lopez and Emiliano Valdez, to present the research that they undertake as curators and to engage in a dialogue about the challenges, limits, and possibilities opened up by working within the frame of an art institution, especially around constructing new histories, um, digging up new archives um, and thinking about new stories of Central American art as they make exhibitions and I'm especially interested to hear about their process of kind of make, the, making legible really complex practices to a range of audiences and how their research takes the, the shape not only of the catalog essay but also the exhibition and all the conversations and even the bureaucratic procedures that attend to the complexities of, being, of curating this work. I invited Miguel and Emiliano for a number of reasons. Not only do they both produce groundbreaking shows that demonstrate visually how one make, might make research public, but they were both in Southern California this past weekend, so it's cheap to bring them as opposed to more expensive from <laughs> elsewhere. Uh, they were both there for the openings of the Getty-sponsored initiative Pacific Standard Time LA LA, a series of some 80 exhibitions about Latinx and Latin American art. Um, that is a, a tremendous um, resource, and I hope everyone gets a chance to visit Southern California um, from now until January to see some of those shows. Uh, before I introduce them in greater detail, I want to say thank you to our co-sponsors, which are the Departments of Spanish and Portuguese Studies, the History of Art, and Art Practice. And thank you, as always, um, to Laura Pearson, my Associate Director, for her invaluable and graceful logistical coordination. I also want to mention that our next event features the dancer and choreographer Will Rawls, who is undertaking a collaboration with Claudia Rakin, the Pulitzer Prize winning poet of Citizen. Uh, Will is presenting his work under the rubric Movement as Research, and that will take place on Wednesday, October 18th at 5.30 in 308A Doe Library, followed by a response by Tanika Seelou Thompson. And I hope, please come, I hope to see you there. Also, if you are a student, um, grad or undergrad, who is interested in our upcoming DIY Couture Lab, which is a garment-making workshop that will culminate in a fashion show at our spring conference on hobby, vernacular, low, informal, and self-taught production called Amateurism Across the Arts, please email the Arts Research Center. That should be really interesting and fun. And I also want to invite you to the reception that will follow after the presentations and our conversation that will be right across the hall. Um, for wine and cheese. Miguel Lopez is the chief curator of Teoretica in San Jose, Costa Rica, as well as a prolific writer and one of the most important voices working today to excavate political, feminist, and queer histories of Latin American art. He's curated a number of significant shows, including God is Queer for the 31st Sao Paulo Biennial and Losing the Human Form, a seismic image of the 1980s in Latin America at the Reina Sofia in 2012. His exhibit, The Words of Others, Leon Ferrari and, the Rhetoric, and Rhetoric in Times of War, which is part of LA LA, opened this weekend and was accompanied by an epic performance at Red Cat. Truly astonishing to see that. He's written for periodicals such as After All, Manifesto Journal, EFLEX Art in America, Art Nexus, and Art Journal, and in 2016, he received the Independent Vision Curatorial Award from Independent Curators International in New York, which he deserved. Emiliano Valdez is Chief Curator of the Museum of Modern Art in Medellin, Colombia, and recently served as the Associate Curator for the 10th Guangzhou Biennial. Through his curation, editorial projects, and advocacy, he has played a major role in transform transforming narratives about contemporary art from an anti-colonial perspective. His exhibition, Guatemala from 33,000 Kilometers, Contemporary Art, 1960 to the Present, just opened across three venues in Santa Barbara, the Museum of Contemporary Art, the Community Arts Workshop, and Westmont Ridley Tree Museum of Art. Um, and it's the first extensive survey of recent Guatemalan art in the U.S. and we'll be talking about that today. Along with many other positions, Emiliano has been a curatorial fellow at Documenta 13, the managing editor at Contemporary Magazines in London, 
the co-curator of the Eighth Biennial of Visual Art in Nicaragua, and the artistic director of Photo 30, a contemporary photography and image festival in Guatemala City. So please join me in welcoming Miguel and Emiliano. And I think Miguel will go first. Hi. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, to Julia, to Lauren, and to Research Charles Center for this uh, really nice invitation to share my work. Um, I, I know that this, uh, this conversation is about Central American art, uh, but I decided to include uh, some of my curatorial work in South America because this is uh, this you know this practice uh, informs my current. Um, uh, my, my current work in Theoretica, where I'm chief curator, as Julia said. So I'm going to present some uh, curatorial research that I developed uh, over the past probably six years, and then to uh, briefly share some of the initiatives that we are developing in, in Costa Rica uh, uh, in, in relation to Central American art and the possibility to rewrite uh, the art histories of the region. Okay, so this presentation, um, the title of this presentation is Diving into the Archives. I'm going to, to focus on the concept of or the relationship between curatorial research and, and the archives. Um, this presentation reflects on the opportunities that archives offers to curatorial research practice. I will share some specific ideas related to my own experience as researcher, writer, and curator. In the first place, I will share some ideas of the work of Red Conceptualism del Sur, Southern Conceptualism's Network, a collective international platform that seeks to research and generate archives, as well to experiment with the reactivation of the local political memory. Secondly, I will comment a few projects developed in Theoretica in Costa Rica that can illustrate the role that, ar that archive have in some of our recent art historical and curatorial research projects related to Central American art, the archives. Thinking. Okay. Perfect. In 2007, a group of six researchers and art historians and activists, including myself, co-founded Red Conceptualism del Sur, Southern Conceptualism's network, we met each other through our common interest in political narratives about Latin American art and our shared concerns about the unclear fate of important art archives in our region. My involvement began when I met art historian and writer Anna Rangoni in Buenos Aires in August 2006. At that moment, I was immersed in research about early experimental practices in Peru and found her essays and books on 60s, or 60s, on 60s avant-garde practices in Argentina, encouraging and inspiring. Meeting Anna changed my understanding of art history as a framework for passionate commitment and political engagement. In 2007, she was invited to contribute to a seminar at the MACBA, the Contemporary Art Museum of Barcelona. She invited myself and other five Latin American researchers to get involved in the public activities, which was when we founded the network which now includes more than 60 researchers, art historian writers from different places. The network grew quickly. Our first collective conversations were about how new market demands on Latin American conceptual art could obstruct the process of politically reactivating a constellation of experimental art practices developed under condition of violence, dictatorial regimes and civil wars between 1960s and 1980s. For us, contributing to the reactivation of these radical legacies implied not only writing or curating, but also required thinking how to generate conditions for the conservation of these materials in our own context. This is a delicate issue in countries where artistic communities distrust the existing governmental institutions because of their authoritarian and repressive past. We felt that it was necessary to intervene in order to prevent the danger of dispossession and the physical loss of art documents. So we, so we have to trigger a larger discussion around the urgency to implement collective responses to the care of material patrimony while involving local institutions. 
We wanted to collaborate with museums and universities to create public archives or loan for these archives, to move artists' archives to institutions and give them public access. Since 2008, Southern Conceptualism's network has worked on several archives of artists whose work was fiercely positioned against military dictatorship during the 60s, 70s and 80s. We began our attempts to generate a new politics of preservation and public access in 2008 with the Uruguayan poet and artist Clemente Padin. We worked to transform his personal archive into a public center of documentation in Montevideo City, Uruguay. The project was born out um, of the artist's concerns due to the recurring offers from private collectors to acquire his personal archive of experimental poetry and publication from the 60s and 80s. During those decades, um, Padin was one of the main promoters of various additional editorial sorry, initiatives that built networks between Latin America, the United States, um, the United States and Central and Eastern Europe at a time of harsh political repression. In 1997, Padin was detained by the Uruguayan dictatorship and his archive was impounded, losing in the process many books, magazines and works, which were never returned. The arrest prompted an extensive international protest campaign organized by the Maynard Network that demanded freedom for Padin and his colleague Jorge Caraballo, summarized in the slogan, Free Padin, Free Caraballo. After being freed in 1979, the artist began to establish contact with the Maynard Network and to reconstruct his archive. In 2009, with the founding of the Reina Sofia Museum, two members of our network completed a general diagnostic of, uh, diagnostic of his archive. That year, we began conversations about the archive, archive's custody with the General Archive of the Uni Universidad de la República, the, the Public University of Montevideo, to guarantee a safe place for it and cataloging criteria that would assure its proper conservation and use. During this process, collaborating with the Reina Sofia Museum became an example for conservation policies different from those of a conventional private acquisition by large museums in Europe and the United States, in which the material is usually displaced from its original country to the hemispheric north. north. <clears throat> what our network seeks instead is to empower local institutions. This first experience allowed us to implement similar projects on other cities. In 2011, we started working with the Archive of Chilean Activist Art Collective, CADA, Colectivo Acciones de Arte, whose work was developed during the years of Pinochet dictatorship. The situation with this archive, consisting in photographs, documents, and remnants of artwork, was very particular because the initial intention of his custodians was to sell it to an institution outside Chile, given the distrust of, of uh, national institutions. Our job was to open a dialogue to imagine ways to keep the archive in Chile and to incorporate it into an institution, ensuring public access. After a difficult start, and with the collaboration of artists, the Amel Eldit and Lottie Rosenfeld, both of them are former, former members of CADA, our network came to an agreement with the Museo de la Memoria de los Derechos Humanos, the Museum of Memory and Human Rights in Santiago de Chile. After a, long first, uh, after, a long, after a long first diagnosis and inventory of materials, an important part of the archive was moved to its documentation center of the Museo de la Memoria, where it's located now. One of our more recent projects is with the Peruvian Swiss artist Francisco Mariotti um, and Maria Louis, two of the most important figures of our collective experiences in Peru during the 70s and 80s. Their archive, which um, we included silk screen photographs, newspaper clippings, manuscripts, video footage, among other materials, have been in Switzerland since 1982, following their departure, uh, so, sorry, following yeah, their departure from Peru. Our intention was for the archive to return to Lima. The, 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 this is the archive, they were, this is a picture from like, March this year. They were sending the material from Switzerland to Peru. Um, and I stay on long-term loan at the Lima Museum, the Mali. Uh, the project involved the organization and digitizing of the archive to assure its public access and a large exhibition at the museum in 2000, uh, 
19. This is a, a photograph like four, five months ago when we were receiving the archive in, in Lima. The exhibition will be based on the archival materials which have to trace uh, some collective experimental practices that reshape the social dimension of art in Peru in the late 20th century, curating the archive. Diving into the archives and patiently recovering forgotten material give rise to a different way to conceptualize an exhibition, one in which waving narratives doesn't depend on conventional categories or, star or established art figures. An example is the exhibition Losing the Human Form, a seismic image of the 1980s in Latin America, a reading of the 80s through the lens of creative social disobedience that our network curated at the Museo Reina Sofia in Madrid in 2012. The project, which was also exhibited in Lima and Buenos Aires between 2013 and 2014, presented a vision of the tensions between art, politics and activism that took place during the 1980s through more than 600 elements photographs, videos, and sound recording, to graphic and documentary material, as well as installation and drawings. The show, the show <coughs> evoked a, an image of the 1980s in Latin America that established a counterpoint between the effects of violence and on, on bodies and the radical experiment in freedom and transformation than question the repressive order. The exhibitions the exhibition points out the multiple and simultaneous appearance of new ways of making art and politics in different parts of Latin America in the 1980s. It presents the results of a research project whose first phase was concentrated on certain episodes from Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay, Brazil and Peru, with the inclusion of some individual case studies from Mexico, Colombia and Cuba. For us, the long decade of the 1980s begins in 1973, the year of Pinochet's coup d'etat in Chile, and continues up to 1994 when the Zapatista movement inaugurates a new cycle of protests. The period corresponds to the consolidation of neoliberalism as a new hegemony, the demise of the real socialism and the crisis of the traditional left. The exhibition renders this panorama complex by retrieving experiments which suggest forms of resistance through fragile supports like silk like screen, performance, video, poetic action, experimental theater, and, particip and participative architecture. These practices were grouped into three main areas. The first was visual politics, driven by social movements, like the Madre de Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, and Mujeres por la Vida in Chile. The second was sexual disobedience and queer activism. And the last, the last was the underground scene and its amateur and do-it-yourself aesthetics. A project like this, including a hundred of elements, many of which has, uh, had never been shown before, was only possible because this specific project was comprised of more than 35 researchers working together to create a dialogue between the materials. These researchers were, um, I mean, they are based in, in different countries in, in Latin America. Collaborative work or collective curating, in this case, is important because it offers a possibility to create transversal historical discussion that go, that go beyond the limits of individual working. Another advantage of working with archival material is that they offer the opportunity to build narratives whose starting points goes beyond the usual suspects of Latin American art. In fact, some opinions um, criticize the absence of big names like, this, like Luis Kamnitzer, Eugenio Dittborn, Silvio Meireles, Victor Gripo, among, among others, which I think is a rather naive criticism, because clearly what interested us and what the archive offered was the opportunity to escape the canon. We wanted to interpret the decade against the grain, to rethink it from ignored materials, residual episodes, and semi-clandestine experiments, unearthed, unearthed as a result of new investigations. By including a variety of experiences of creative activism, both from artists and civil and, and group from the uh, civil society, we were not interested in entering into the stereo 
debate about whether this may or not or may not be considered art, which was a minor issue for us, a real underst uh, understanding of art is convenient as forms of control by the market or some institutional discourses, but it is hardly useful to, to recognize and appreciate the many creative practices, amateur aesthetics, and politicized visual culture that emerge from urgency and social commotion. While it was important for us to question our history, we were even more interested in thinking about how these, exper how these experiences might interrogate and add new episodes to the history of politic politics itself. So I'm going to talk about um, Theoretica. Theoretica, this is the, the picture of the facade of Theoretica in San Jose. Archival practices are also very present in some of the work we are currently developing in Theoretica in Costa Rica. Theoretica is a non-profit visual art organization founded in 1999 by Virginia Perraton, a Costa Rican artist and curator. Its mission is to contribute to the research and diffusion of contemporary art practices in Central America and the Caribbean in dialogue with global realities. During the last few years, archival practice has become more and more central to some of our main initiatives. They help with us to trigger a reflection about how can we historicize contemporary art and engage with local context in a different way. For the last three years, Theoretica has been organizing its own archive that includes materials related to the history of the institutions, to contemporary art practices from Central America and the Caribbean, but also to the artistic, curatorial, and theoretical work of Virginia Perraton, the founder. The archive includes manuscripts, correspondence, unpublished texts, photographs, audio interview, and video documentation of public talks, performances, exhibitions, among much more. It takes shapes, it takes shape, it takes shape as a source for search and consultation, and is also related to the collection, uh, uh, the collection was created by Virginia, the founder, which included more than 500 uh, pieces mm, that Theoretica look after. Look after. We are the, like the custody. We are like the custody, custody of, of the of the collection. It, it doesn't belong to Theoretica. We are in charge of look after the collection. Um, we are working to create a searchable database both digitally online and also physically at our space. And we would like to promote experimental curatorial approaches to these materials. Right now, we are starting to work in an exhibition for Moac in Mexico City about the cultural and intellectual legacy and work of Virginia Perraton, who was, as I said, a key figure in researching and promoting Central American art since mid-90s, transforming the institutional and critical la landscape in the region. With, our, with archival practice, is also integrated within recent curatorial endeavors. For us, it is about how curatorial enterprises seek to prevent that some bodies of work disappear, and how can it create possibilities to recognize and create new cultural value, in most of the cases against the dominant male culture. In Central America, the artistic valorization of a number of brilliant artists wasn't fully created yet as it is the case of Costa Rican Victoria Cabezas. Actually, part of her early graphic work was discarded by the artist last Christmas because she thought they didn't have any relevance. This is a picture I, I took uh, in January uh, this year. Uh, there are some like silk screen prints on metal and we were like um, watching them at the, at the kitchen because she actually Left, uh, left these materials at, at her backyard, uh, waiting for the garbage uh, truck to, to actually take them. Um, her work from early 70s addressed with humor the international politics of bananas to make a comment about sexual desire, consumption, commercialization of, of good and bodies, and its interdependence with the construction of masculinity. Cabezas started his series when she was studying at the Florida, at the Florida University, in the United States, during 1972-1973. Her point of departure uh, were the Banana Wars, also known as the 
American Caribbean Wars, which were a series of occupations um, and military intervention in Central America and the Caribbean caused or influenced by the United States to protect its commercial interests in countries such as Panama, Honduras, Nicaragua, Haiti, or Dominican Republic. The artist proposes a parody and a critique of the masculine spaces of the plantation and factory world, combining them with a humoristic hyperbole about how Latin America has figured in US culture as an exotic other. One of her most important projects from 1980s is Mujeres, Gatos y Televisores, Women, Cats and TV, and TVs, that she started while living in New York, studying photography at the Pratt Institute. These photographs explore critically the rhythms of television and women's everyday lives. Cabezas uses her own body and her apartment to reflect how soap opera shape social cultural needs, emotion, reflecting also on the experience of being isolated at home. In her photos, the affected ties with cats appear as a metaphor of destruction and disruption regarding traditional masculine-driven mass media representation. She plays with a sort of female viewership, blurring the limits between reality and fiction, and emphasizing how love and gender relationship are also constructed by television's representational, representational practices. We are preparing an exhibition for the Gallery of America Society in New York for January 2019 that will bring together this early 1970s and 80s experiment by Cabezas in dialogue with the work of Priscilla Monge, uh, who since mid-90s has question, had questioned how gender hierarchies condition social spaces, experimenting with embroidery, photography, sculpture, film, and installation. The project aims to present two distinct yet intertwined bodies of work made by two Costa Rican artists from different generations two figures that help us to complicate narrative of art and feminist practice in Central America. We also developed a curatorial research <coughs> about Nicaraguan artist and educator Patricia Belli. The intention of this project was to present a revision of three decades of her work between 1986 and 2016, but also to help to organize her personal archive that included more than five a hundred slides of sculptures and work that she produced since early 1980s, most of them lost and destroyed. A large number of these digitized images will be included in a monographic, in a monographic publication we are preparing now, that should be ready in one month and a half, more or less. It is a, a photograph of last, uh, we, I took last year when we were organizing her, her archive in, in Costa Rica. Um, and also the, this material will be available for research of the research at uh, the research center in Theoretica very soon. After being shown in Theoretica, the exhibition traveled to Nicaragua in February this year, and, is, and it is now in Guatemala. It's a picture of the exhibition in Managua. For me, it is very revealing the way in which different images of fragmented. And this, sorry, fragmented and dislocated bodies have appeared in her work. Representation of cut extremities in works like the series, like like this, in the series of maps from 1986, or Trampas um, from the this is from the late 90s, or the representation of bone structure or exposed organic systems in work like Columna Rota. Vejez, that you can see here, or Objeto from 2000. Belly explores the implication of inhabiting a body and the shame and angst and inadequateness that this entails at different points in life. In more recent installations, Belly constructs dynamic sculptures through a game which weights and balances. In Porfiadas, this is a, a sculpture from 2015, three reproductions of a human head places on the ground, placed on the ground await for the pendulous movement of a baseball bat to be activated by the visitors. In this exploration of corporality, 
basic belly also evoke the fact of having been born without hair follicles, which for her has meant living forever without hair on her head and body. The representation of a bald head is a disturbing and subversive image to the hegemonic norm, which regards a woman's long hair as a form of verifying what a healthy, desirable, female heterosexual body should be. That physical condition has allowed Bailey to establish a highly critical relationship with, soci with socially assigned identity mark. The artist uses those signs of sickness, sickness and androgyny in, 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 in different works, like for example, Pelo, in which she invites, invites us to be a voyeur in a game in which Bailey and a, and a week defy and triaticalize her own gender and sexual identity. Exploring her work was also an opportunity to rethink the role of visual representations during one of the most notable moments of cultural and political transformation in Nicaragua at the end of the 20th century, the transition from the revolutionary Sandinismo of the 1980s to the neoliberal regime of the 1990s. On one hand, Patricia Belli was one of the three forces in the breakdown of artistic languages in the 1980s. Although this emerging experimentalism constituted a provocation to traditions of modern Nicaraguan art, like abstraction, influenced by European abstraction, the development of, the development of installations, happenings, and ephemeral works was above all a visceral response and a political stance reacting to the reality at hand. On the other hand, her work accompanied the emergence of feminist debate and feminist groups, which look to redefine modes of understanding and doing politics. Her practice claimed, claimed control of her desire and sexuality, and confronted masculine hegemony and hierarchies, functioning within revolutionary Sandinista discourses, exploring the role of women of traditionally feminine labor and gender violence through a reappraisal of the vulnerable body and her own sexual pleasure. Archive, and I'm finishing with, with this, um, is also present in the organization of more experimental exhibitions, like the one we presented uh, last May, entitled Let's Kiss All Together. The first historical and documentary revision of the history of LGBT, LGBT movement, movements in Costa Rica. The project developed in collaboration with queer organization Frente por los Derechos Igualitarios, presented oral testimonies, video interviews, press clipping, photos, images and works created by the local queer community, objects and materials used in public demonstrations, alongside a large number of quotes of sexual workers, trans and feminist activists, that illustrates how the struggles and demands has changed since 1950s to the present. The project was an open archive and an invitation to collective building of history. And finally, another important aspect of our current work is the reactivation of the editorial program. Last year, we launched, we launched um, local writings, critical positions on Central America, the Caribbean, and their diasporas. That is a series of monographic bilingual books that collect key texts from a number of brilliant artists, writers, art historians, curators, and thinkers that contributed to re-energizing the art scenes in their own context. The first two books were by Costa Rican, Cuban, curator Tamara Diaz, and Panamanian art critic and writer Adrian Samos. These are the two books that you see here, and actually I will bring them for the library, so you will have them here. And the two next uh, publication collects, es collects essays by Guatemalan art critic Rosina Casali, and Puerto Rican art historian Maricarmen Ramirez. Some of the upcoming books are also based on archival research, such as is the case of Raúl Quintanilla, Nicaraguan artist, artist, writer, activist, and former director of the National School of Arts. His writings and editorial work are one of the most important testimonies of cultural politics during the Sandinista Revolution and a critical reflection about the relationship between revolution and the visual arts in Nicaragua. Some of these materials remain published until this date. So I'm going to leave it here.
Thank you so much. Saturday as part of uh, PST, which is an ambitious and wide-ranging um, group of exhibitions, um, largely sponsored and, and uh, put forward by um, the Getty. Um, this is the only exhibition dedicated to a Central American country, and it's the first survey, as Julia also said, of Guatemalan art in the United States. It's also to a very large extent, and I think in this dimension, um, the first attempt to trace the emergence of contemporary practices in Guatemala. Um, I'm going to speak on the presentation, so I'm just going to set up a clock so that I keep time. Um, the exhibition started nearly four years ago when, when the Getty um, opened the call uh, for a proposal for the museums in Southern California to carry out new scholarship on themes that were, that were wanting to um, break with monolithic narratives about what it was uh, Latin America and Latinx art. Um, the director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Santa Barbara and my co-curator, Rika Garcia, reached out to me um, with an idea. She, um, she contacted me through Facebook and she said, you don't know me, but I'm such and such. Um, and I followed your work and I was wondering if you'd be interested in putting together a proposal for the Getty um, that explains a series of questions that I have and that I think many people in the United States have. And this consisted in something very simple. Um, she said that she'd come in contact with a group of artists, um, Darío Escobar, Regina Galindo, um, a conceptual artist called Daniel López, um, all of whom are in the exhibition, of course, which came to prominence around the year 2000. Um, and a lot of these artists, or many of these artists, uh, they were all uh, from a generation that um, were, became known outside of the United States because after the peace agreements uh, were signed in Guatemala in 1996, there was a, re a renewed sort of environment for the promotion of the arts and for freedom of expression. Um, and that made possible several things. I mean, I think the country really entered into into what at the time was a hopeful moment and hopefully um, and what we thought was going to be also one of connection to the rest of the world. I think um, uh, recent events, including the ones of the, literally the last couple of days, are demonstrating um, quite the opposite. But at the time it felt like the new uh, century was going to be the one for the development in many ways of Guatemala. Um, so she said that a lot of these artists, while they were starting to be known in the United States, um, she really had no idea um, where they came from. And where they, by where they came from, they meant not only information about the country, meaning about Guatemala itself, uh, and especially in Santa Barbara, um, a highly white, um, wealthy community, um, but also where they came from in terms of uh, art history, in terms of what, where they had developed from. And I think that had to do a lot with the circumstances of the country itself, being in other war, and how that had developed. Um, and how those conditions of repression had for decades kept um, the development, the, the historical developments of the country um, within its own borders. Um, so we started working on an exhibition that uh, we didn't really know what it was going to be. Um, and that uh, we ended up calling Guatemala from 33,000 kilometers after the painting on the right, which is a painting by the modernist uh, experimental master, if I have seen as you see, um, the silhouette of the country on the bottom corner, laying on what seems to be um, a celestial body, possibly the earth. Um, this was done in 1960, a year that this exhibition takes its very point. And I think it marks on one hand the sort of optimism that really permeated um, not only the country, but I would argue the whole world in the 1960s. I mean, we're about to reach the moon, the world is, 
these discoveries that were almost over, um, it really felt like the world was going to be different and better. Um, in Guatemala, there had been a, a dramatically uh, progressive government from 1944 to 1954, um, and I think the enthusiasm from those years was still felt in the air. This man painted this uh, really tour de force painting. It's, it's about, um, I think, about 10 or 15 feet, I think it's 15 feet by 4 feet or something like that. Um, and you see, you see the image obstructed only by another celestial body. So really, this idea of Guatemala being part of a larger universe, and we're really interested in that idea, in, in how at the time and still today we could think of the possibility of um, uniting an art historical narrative of the country with that of the wider world, and also trying to incorporate it, um, because as she had rightly pointed out, many of these artists and the way they had uh, work and, and the way they were connected to other practices in Latin America wasn't really uh, known. Um, obviously there was an issue of the distance and that was something that we were, that we were trying to... The, this notion of the distance was really essential in our putting together the exhibition. The distance between Guatemala and the place where it was first going to be seen, which is uh, Santa Barbara, the United States um, at large. Um, that of historical distance as well, and we're trying to look bar back and trying to trace where, where those current artistic practices, in particular the ones that she, she mentioned that emerged around the 2000s, um, where they came from and, and how that seeing things um, retrospectively could help us build a history of art that hopefully would do justice not only to those artists that, have, that weren't known and that had not been um, seen in the United States, but also to other artists that we felt were, had been left out of the very limited historical narratives that were created in Guatemala. So the other thing that we did, and I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit, um, maybe it's not going to be nice. I think it's further down possibly the, the image, but the other thing that we did is we included this other painting on the left, which is um, on one of the title walls. The exhibition is um, it's installed along uh, in three different venues, so there's, uh, there's, a, there's a slightly different variation um, in each of them. And what we wanted to do was incorporate into that canon, into the, that narrative, practices that have been developing and that are still developing in Guatemala that have very rarely taken into consideration when the, when the official history of art is told. That's a painting by an artist uh, from an indigenous community called Lorenzo um, Gonzalez Morales. And he belongs to a tradition, to, to a, from a very, to a very interesting tradition um, that would normally, and from a Western-centric perspective, be called naive or primitive. Now, something that we were very clear early on is that we wanted to incorporate these other ways of understanding art, artistic practices that work from 2011 into the way we were building or we were telling that history. Meaning, um, this did not or is not from the perspective of the exhibition a primitive or a naive work of art, but it's really a work of art in the same um, right as uh, F.I. Rosino's uh, title piece. So the exhibition tells the story of that, of that development from 1916 till today through a series of um, historical and uh, essential moments in that history. One of them is the Grupo Vertebra, a group, a group of uh, socially engaged artists um, formed in 1961. Um, of which you can see here a sample by Roberto Cabrera, who's the man in um, the, the center in this photograph. And El Encuentro is um, an object, an object that came possibly from a, um, from a car that was attacked by the repressive forces of Guatemala in the 1960s. Um, and the Grupo Imaginaria, uh, another group that was inspired on the previously shown Grupo Vertebra, from which came artists that are, I think, also well known in this context today, such as Luis Gonzalez Palma, the photographer on the right, or even Pablo Suezi, born in Mexico, but, um, but who grew, in, uh, grew up in the United States. Um, so the exhibition uh, is held, as I said, in three museums, the Museum of Contemporary Art Santa Barbara, for those who have been there, you know, it's a relatively small museum, the Westmont Village Museum of Art, which is part of the, uh, the Westmont College in Montecito, and the Santa Barbara Community Arts Workshop. It has over 90 works of art from 70 artists, 
collectives or collaborations between artists in three venues and it's structured around three nine clusters um, and then they occupy around uh, 10,000 square feet. This idea of the, of the clusters was important because even though the exhibition is not installed based on these themes or these chapters, um, it really helped us um, to structure the exhibition around a certain number of issues that, we've, that we understood to be cross or that crossed that development of um, the, the contemporary practice in Guatemala. Um, I, I'm going to very briefly explain each of them because I think it's important that you understand sort of where these works uh, could be um, thematically located but then when really the exhibition, when we designed the exhibition that ended up um, going into a, into a sort of second lane, meaning not that it wasn't important what they related to but that in order to create that narrative it was more important to, to highlight the, how, how works from different um, sources uh, created or highlighted the, the potential to speak about um, different themes rather than uh, pigeonholing, pigeonholing each work. Um, in the hanging of the exhibition, we did a, a sort of a very basic strategy with cons which consisted in doing the wall labels in different colors according to the cluster. And so even though the exhibition wasn't hung by cluster, if you were really interested to understand how we had um, or where, where we understood the majority of the, of the sort of um, content weight of that piece went, um, you could refer to this key that was included in the gallery guide. The first and um, I would say funda like a fundamental chapter of the exhibition is one called Art and Politics, and I think the title is very self-explanatory. When I think of the more uh, emblematic works of this chapter is this piece by Regina Wallin, that's called Kimbo Radas Guedes, Who Can Erase the Traces? Um, and it's a work in which she walks from the Constitutional Court to the National Palace, um, dipping her feet in blood um, for about, I would say, about a mile or so. Um, she, she did this uh, performance when she found out that uh, Efraín Ríos Mon, who had been uh, one of the dictators in the worst times of the war, had been allowed to be inscribed as a, candidate, as a presidential candidate in 2010. They're also in alphabetical order, so you'll see they're slightly disconnected um, in, in my presentation here, but hopefully it'll make sense when I show you some pictures of how, of how the, um, the exhibition uh, was um, connected. Um, so Art Histories was looking at artists who work either um, in a sort of institutional critique fashion, who either work at art at the history of art, uh, whether national, uh, Guatemalan, or um, to the Western history of art, or other his art, uh, history of art, or at the work of um, other artists or themselves. Um, this is a work by uh, a Mexican uh, couple duo of photographers called Studio Lake Perea, and they, uh, under a commission of, for an exhibition at an institution where I worked for years, in Guatemala, which was the Spanish Cultural Center, they came and they did a study of the state of the murals by Guatemala Naris Carlos Menida, which, as you can see, are, um, are completely abandoned. So this idea of going back and understanding the legacy of other artists and practitioners before them was really what was at the core of this, um, of this uh, group, of this cluster. Uh, the images are hung there on the right. Um, there was one that had to do with formal experimentation early on. Uh, we were very concerned, or we were, we we thought a lot about whether including clusters that also had to do with uh, media or with uh, formal vocabularies. Um, and we ended up leaving only this because we understood that this was one that, in the Guatemalan case, uh, was very connected with the content. So um, we. Um, we had chapters that were dedicated to performance and to other um, sort of ways of, of producing art that we thought had pushed that sense of um, contemporaneity. But we ended up blending those forms into the into the thematic chapters, really, um, and ended up only uh, with this one. Um, there's one that's called gender perspectives, and that looks at different ways of understanding the. Uh, gender relationships both in the uh, indigenous and non-indigenous communities, and I'll get back to that issue, which in the history of Guatemala and Guatemala is essential. Um, 
It's one that's uh, dedicated to land, landscape, and territory. And again, I think this is one of the, uh, along with probably art and politics, one of the most fundamental um, ideas. Land, landscape, and territory incorporates works that both deal with the landscape as uh, a sort of idyllic construction of the country, as a beautiful place, and one that's related to its um, notion of um, country branding, so what the country sells abroad, but also at the very heart, and I'll try to explain this very quickly, at the heart of the political conflict um, in Guatemala, which is um, inextricably connected to the United Fruit Company and uh, the plantation of the bananas. Um, popular culture, so uh, how artists draw from popular cultures, again, both indigenous and non-indigenous, um, and in this case you see the work of uh, very um, very experimental and incredibly influential artist Margarita Surtia, not too prolific, but everybody who worked she did was really um, sort of like a milestone in the history of Guatemala and Ireland. Much of her work, uh, because of the infrastructural um, weakness of the country, hasn't been shown uh, very much. These works, um, coincidentally, were uh, other than in Guatemala, have only been shown in Costa Rica, I think. Uh, I can't remember if I tell it or not, but undoubtedly uh, at an event that was produced by Eugenia Beres um, Raton. Racisms and identities deal with um, the distinction between uh, being an indigenous in Guatemala and not being one, and this is something also that has been uh, not only uh, at the core of really the issue of what it is to be Guatemalan, but also one that has divided the country. Um, both politically, socially, economically, um, historically, the much more uh, abundant indigenous population has been um, much poorer and usually subject to uh, power, the, power, the exertion of power, or the exercise of power of the wider um, and, and, um, and much more uh, white European descendant um, elites. And religion, spirituality, and metaphysics uh, looks at how uh, religion, uh, both from like a Western, I suppose, Catholic and more recently pro Protestant uh, or evangelical perspectives, have merged with um, the Mayan cosmovisions or the different Mayan cosmovisions, because indeed there are, there are several ones, and that in turn, how that has related to um, issues of power as well, because we'll see hopefully in a few minutes how um, historically, when one of the, in the worst moments of the war, um, Efraín Rios Montt, who was this dictator that Regina did the, her, her performance after, um, was the first evangelical um, uh, ruler of the country and that had uh, profound implications into um, how the, the country was uh, run. Um, and finally, violence and trauma is one that connected to uh, Ireland politics, and this is why I say that uh, in this presentation the, the, the clusters were disconnected with reality. Uh, we were hoping to create a sort of a chain of, of, of connections or a chain of sense. Um, violence and trauma picks up on the, um, on the cluster of art and violence and, and assesses what are the implications of a country being, uh, having been at, at war for 36 years. Um, This exhibition, I'm also speaking about this exhibition, or mostly about this exhibition, because in a way it's a culmination um, of many years of research into the relationship between artistic practice and, uh, and the history of Guatemala. Um, and I think, it, for me, it's hard to explain Guatemala from 33,000 kilometers without speaking at least briefly about this exhibition, which is called Esa Historia de la Vuelta de la Esquina, which translates to that history around the corner um, which is a title that I now hate, and if I could like turn back time, it would, it would have a completely different name, but whatever, it was the times. Um, Esa Historia de la Vuelta de la Esquina was an exhibition that I did in 2010, um, along with a researcher, Luis Pedro Taracena, uh, who's a sociologist, uh, and we, we were commissioned an exhibition to try to um, address the issue of uh, the consequences of the civil war in Guatemala, something that had never been done before, and that CIRMA, the institution that commissioned the exhibition, thought that could be could potentially be um, one way of addressing a subject that has been historically uh, incredibly 
not only polemic but also and but also very divisive. Um, today, can we see one work uh, in the exhibition? The discussion as to sorry whether um, there was a genocide or not, which is at the core of this war, is still something that is um, uh, in debate. Um, so, just to give a very brief historical context, from the nineteen through the, around the 1940s, dictator Jorge Ubico um, opened up the, um, the opportunities for a series of uh, foreign companies, amongst them what was later to be the United Fruit Company, uh, uh, the possibility of large portions of land to produce, to, uh, to plant uh, bananas. Um, something that at the time, for a variety of uh, technical, I suppose, reasons related to the way you grow bananas, uh, and it's mostly that at the time, the pesticides and the way to control pests in banana plantations were very limited. So what they had to do is they had they needed to have large amounts of land so that when one plantation, one banana plantation was affected by a pest, they would burn the entire thing and start a completely new one in a different part. This meant that um, uh, banana producing companies had to have uh, much larger uh, amounts of land that they were um, that they actually needed. Um, and that those lands were dormant, uh, lands that were not being used and that were not being uh, that had been sold at, at very low prices to these companies in an attempt to um, trigger the economic development of the country, but that really I would say that in hindsight backfired and, and ended up um, leaving thousands of peasants and of uh, again indigenous uh, groups without lands uh, or farming lands that had been their own but that were no longer at the time. Um, in 1944, a coup, a what is called now a revolution, um, put down Jorge Ubico and introduced a, 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 this to a series of uh, of uh, democratically the democratic or left leaning governments, um, of which the second was uh, Jacob Arbenz Guzman. Jacob Arbenz Guzman introduced a series of reforms that were, um, I would say, far from communist, which was what he was accused by, from, by the United Fruit Company and the strong ties that the United Fruit Company had um, in Washington. Um, and one of which was a land reform, a land reform that was to expropriate lands from the United Fruit Company, especially the dormant ones, at the very low prices that the same United Fruit Company had declared so that they would, to, to avoid any taxation. So uh, come um, Jacob Arbenzan comes along. He says, "Like, but you're not using these lands. You declare them at these low values. We're going to take them back at the at the price that you declare them." Um, this generates uproar, of course, uh, mostly in the company. And at the time, one of the board members of the United Fruit Company was um, the brother of the director of the CIA. Um, that meant that uh, in 1954, a CIA back coup um, introduced Carlos Castillo Armas, which is the man next to the driver. Los Castillo Armas was um, a puppet president, really, um, which, uh, together with uh, members of the army, um, expelled Jacob Arbenz Guzman in 1954. This is a very telling image and that has produced then a series of uh, both of our words, but also of images in, I think, in in the in the imagination of the in the in the national imaginary um, that were existing in English, probably not. Um, this is an image of Carlos Cas of Jacob uh, Guzman um, being forced to undress before uh, being expelled originally to Costa Rica, then to Mexico, and then on uh, to other places. And I think it's telling of uh, what was going on in terms of uh, in terms of politics at the time. Um, somebody that had been working on the um, on the country and its uh, sort of on the progress, really, on what he considered that was the progress of the country, uh, being stripped naked uh, before Gordon the plane um, and, and exiled uh, until he was repatriated, um, only dead, uh, many, many years later. Flash forward a few decades, 1982, Efraim Rosinos, the dictator, again, after which, um, after whose inscription as a, candidate, as a presidential candidate, Regina Galindo did the performance of the, of the bloody feet. Um, announcing that he himself had also carried out a coup, so we have lots of coups, um, and that he was going to be the president. He took over uh, a previous, also military, uh, president, um, 
after there was a sense from a group of in the army that uh, felt that the guerrillas were in fact advancing. So um, he, from then onwards, he carried out some of the bloodiest plans to eradicate the guerrillas that that involved not only the uh, direct war against them, but also the eradication of what, what they call their social support, meaning the places in the countryside where they could hide. This involved um, strategies like scorched earth, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and it's um, also a strategy that was used, for example, in Vietnam, that involved uh, eliminating entire communities through uh, dropping uh, napalm and other, um, and other bombing artifacts. So that exhibition told that story, um, and it was like not only an artistic, but a, a, I would say a multi-level and a multi-vocabulary exhibition. Uh, we had a see, we made a, a timeline, which is something that was that had never been done before. There, were, there was, of course, um, archive photography as well as artistic photography. Um, there were uh, very sort of educational and didactic elements, like uh, blowing up certain images or putting um, putting in context. Um, uh, the conflict in Guatemala with uh, a wider sense of the Cold War, which you can see on the right of this image. Um, that on one hand, and at the same time I was carrying out a series of um, exhibitions on uh, Guatemala mid-career artists, and this is, I think, one of my um, very personal interests, I suppose. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very interested in, in mid-careers. I think it's a time in artistic practice in which artists have already developed a body of work and, and are more or less clear as to um, what their intentions and their interests in art making are, but it's not there. It's not as solidified and untouchable as like the great master. So it's a really interesting um, time to work with them. And this Serie Revisiones was a series of, of uh, seven exhibitions of uh, some of the artists that at the time were um, in that point in their careers, and I think are some of the more um, consequential artists, as well as some of which uh, my co-curator, Mickey Garcia, had heard of. So I thought that it was uh, a really interesting um, coincidence because she had been hearing about this artist, but at the same time, no, there, there hadn't been any exhibition of uh, comprehensive exhibitions of their work in Guatemala. And this was in a place um, that I opened at the time that was called Eccentrico, which is part of, of this institution that I was, uh, that I was working on. Um, and that really, I think, set sort of the tone for, for what I think is now a, a, a more common um, practice of artistic in the research and investigation. Um, and really this idea of presenting the work of artists as um, a, a comprehensive and cohesive um, body of work rather than as, as independent or, or singled out uh, works here and there. Um, these artists were Jorge de Leon. Um, this is a piece of uh, Jorge de Leon was uh, for years a uh, member of, of a gang. It's also a bit of a cheesy story because he really found redemption through art. Um, but it were, had, were not for the fact that his work is actually very poignant and very, um, very telling of, uh, of the history of Guatemala. This is a series of x-rays in which you can see um, the consequences of he having been involved with uh, with, uh, with, um, with the with the with the gangs, um, so um, tattoos, um, injuries, um, and um, and um, I mean and another such yeah uh, marks of his previous life on his body, um, and it's called um, autobiography. Uh, an artist called Aníbal López who. Uh, was I think not in this document but in the in the document before, and he is I think one of the most interesting, uh, truly and deeply conceptual artists in Guatemala. This is uh, um, one of his more playful works. Um, each each uh, painting, reading uh, for sale, uh, for rent, um, for loan, and to give away, uh, and each of these uh, paintings is subject to. That action. So the one for sale is sold, um, the one for rent is rented, the one uh, for loan is, is literally loan, and the other one is, is gifted, both originally from the artist and then from whichever the market uh, will take them on. Um, Alejandro Paz is an, arti an architect and an artist um, whom also designed the, the, 
the exhibition of this one, but Guatemala from 33,000. And this is one of his most significant works. It's, a, it's, a, it's an action or performance in which he pays an indigenous woman to run on a treadmill until exhaustion. Now the world, the, the piece is, is called Faja, and Faja in Spanish stands both for the treadmill as well as uh, for the um, belt that women use as part of their uh, traditional outfit. So this idea that an indigenous woman um, who would normally walk for miles and miles a day to get even to the closest school or to get water um, is running on a treadmill is like an absurdity. And uh, finally, Jasmine Hash. Um, mostly a painter who in uh, 2011 developed a project that I'll explain a little bit more in depth later that's called Aldea Modelo Pequeña Historia, so that's Model Village, Small History 1984. And the Model Villages, just very quickly, are, um, as the name says, um, Model Villages that the, that the army did in throughout Guatemala to displace the population, to eliminate their cultural and political connection from their place of birth. So they moved entire populations because by displacing them, they, they took away their possibility to connect with other members. They sort of uh, exiled them in their own country. Um, the army members used to live inside this town, so effectively they also used the indigenous communities as human shields. So going back, these two large, these two projects, so these two other projects, um, I think are really at the sort of at the at the at the base and at the core of Guatemala from 33,000. So I wanted to bring them in very quickly, just to um, just so that you have an idea where this other uh, where the information for this exhibition comes. And now I'm going to go very quickly because I realize I'm running out of time uh, through some of the images of the exhibition, but I'm both happy to uh, discuss works later with you or. Um, yeah, just share, give you the images or engage in other conversations. Um, but the exhibition starts with this amazing work by a uh, New York-based artist Ronnie Mokan called Welcome. Um, he, like many Guatemalans, migrated to the States. And I think that migration happens in different conditions. The Ronnie's was, I mean, altogether not so bad. He didn't have to cross the border, walk to the United States and cross the border. But finally, his was also both a cultural and an economic migration. He's an artist and a graphic designer. Um, and he and his wife Jessica also noticed in the exhibition decided to move there um, both to pursue I suppose a better future but also uh, the possibility of having access to arts and culture which is something that they were um, hoping to um, intensify I suppose in the States. And the work is called Welcome um, and it has to do with obviously their experience of coming into the United States and is made through um, whenever it's installed um, he asks member of the surrounding community of the museum or the institution that holds the exhibition to lend their welcome at their dormants um, to, um, to the institution for the duration of, of the exhibition. This is the one that we have managed to source from um, the neighbors of uh, the museum. Um, and there's one that says Dreamers Welcome, which I thought was uh, particularly appropriate for, for the days we're living. Um, and this is what welcomes the exhibition. In a way, it had to do with also the community of Santa Barbara welcoming um, this exhibition, also the Guatemalan art, and, and, and this idea of, uh, of general of, uh, hospitality uh, in general. Then, after the titles and other things, there's this, uh, this series of works that deal um, with that with that development uh, of uh, of the genocidal moment, um, and in particular, this piece by Isabel Ruiz, which is called a Historia Social. It's uh, an installation from a series of works that is made out of charcoal, burned chairs, and these um, semi-cross with uh, abstractions of Mayan symbology in the middle, and it mimics, um, or it uh, suggests uh, a, a mourning, a funeral, um, of uh, some of the communities that were destroyed during, uh, through the scorcher policy. This is uh, shown in relation to these photographs um, on, the, on the upper part of the, of the image by Oscar Farfan, in which he uh, presents this uh, apparently idyllic uh, landscapes, but are landscapes that were once existed communities that again were erased by that. Um, in relation to those pieces, also shown this um, really sort of witty and, and, and worrying, um, but also incisive piece by Kike Lee that reads, Aquí si hubo genocidio aquí no, and that means, that translates to, here there was a genocide, and here 
and on the other panel it says here there wasn't. And I think that really represents that sort of uh, discussion that's going on and that has been going on in Guatemala as to the legal, the use of legal terms um, because, um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a wider and complex discussion, but basically if there wasn't the intention to completely eradicate the population, it wasn't a genocide and that, what that means is that you cannot accuse somebody of, um, of crimes of um, humanity. I, the, 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 the full legal term escapes me. But this is something that has divided uh, the entire country. You can imagine that this is deeply um, connected to the way people relate to politics nowadays. Of course, this idea of the Banana Republic, uh, obviously connected to the history of the United Fruit Company and how the then uh, puppet um, government uh, happened. Um, combined with a, with a fantastic work by a photographer Andrea Aragon in, that tries to give a sense of how the, the, of how the United States are still influential in the country today. Um, both through, I mean, what I suppose is more soft politics, but also through the implications of things like uh, migration and the money that is sent by, uh, by uh, migrants to their families um, who stay in the country. Um, that sense of um, identity inquiry uh, then moves on to the next venue, which is the West Wonder Between Museum of Art. Uh, as I said, it's a museum that's inside uh, a university, so we wanted to uh, include there a series of words that had that sort of question really what it was to be Guatemalan um, in many ways, in the sort of racial sense that I sort of touched upon briefly, uh, but also in other ways, but also in in, in questioning the, the normal behavior in terms of uh, gender and sexual identity, this is another work by any of this conceptual artist that I was mentioning, that's called recent, um, Just Married, and that deals with um, the implications of uh, such a, like a hugely important institution in Guatemala, and I think all Catholic countries, which is marriage. Um, in front of it is included this piece by Paula Nietzsche, another indigenous feminist artist uh, who comes from San Juan Comala, another town with a painterly tradition. And she's done a series of paintings in which she imagines that are portraits of her dreams, in which she, uh, many of which, of, uh, which uh, portrait her um, either flying or in positions of liberating herself from um, historic and gender related um, of her oppressive situations. Um, and here in the foreground, and here's another picture of the Aldea Modelo, um, this uh, other image that I had mentioned around this model villages, and now she's taking it a step forward and, and turned that, that original very sort of flat image into this uh, fold of uh, pop up books um, that try to mimic the, the urbanistic organization of the, um, of the model villages. And this is connected to a series of words that bring together the traditions of Western history of art with uh, certain notions that are that are fundamental in again my own cosmovision, like the idea of the knot, which is uh, essential in understanding what are what the problems are in uh, in the Mayan indigenous uh, cultures. There's another view. And finally, um, the Community Arts Workshop, which is uh, the last venue, um, a venue that is in the middle of the city, that is clearly not one uh, that was built for um, showcasing art, um, and that in a, to a large extent really exemplifies how historically exhibitions in Guatemala have been made. I was really interested in having also space. Um, there wasn't entirely a museum, and, and especially a museum in it's a very sort of pristine and professional ways because this is more or less how things have been done in the country and um, I wanted that also to be somehow present. And the, 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 the two um, or the, the two or three clusters that are included here have to do with um, uh, religion, um, metaphysics and spirituality and you see the work of Rodolfo Uraracha, one of the great master whose work is born in the MoMA collection and other places, but also that in relation to how younger artists and indigenous artists are understanding this sense of existence today and their relationship with the divine and the sublime. Um, and back again to the sense um, of artists revisiting the work of other artists, and this is Benvenuto Chalhai, a hugely influential um, indigenous contemporary artist who did um, this large project, which is the hanging of these tiny sculptures that were done by uh, a man called Feliciano Bob. 
and was the mayor of his native uh, San Pedro La Laguna, and that he, through an installation, sort of turned into um, extrapolated and brought and, 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 and placed into a contemporary history of art. And finally, um, a little formal geometric and abstract extravaganza, um, trying to sort of trace how uh, artists in Guatemala were connected to wider, um, wider geometric and abstract practices, uh, but how that was also at the same, well, that, how that was related to uh, other other themes that underlie the exhibition, such as uh, the popular cultures and and, um, and political issues. Um, yeah, so I'm going to leave it there. The book is forthcoming. It's going to be out, I hope, in a couple of weeks. We It wasn't ready for the exhibition because we wanted to include pictures from the installation. And we're going to have a symposium on October 20th um, in uh, the West Bend Literary Museum of Art. I encourage you all to come down. It's a beautiful drive, and hopefully it will be really interesting. Uh, I don't know, like he, he lost chain 
and he showed me like the things that she kept, you know, in her her in her in her in her lock. How is it that money in her like uh, closet? In her closet. Um, because she really actually believed that this material had any value, I didn't have any value. So I was surprised when I when, when she actually uh, showed me like original slides, you know, like uh, uh, black and white negatives, uh, gelatin silver prints, you know, documents, you know, even the notes about her own process because she was very rigorous, you know, about um, I don't know, like about uh, the, the the photograph that she she produced in, in during the eighties. She actually invented a sort of like chemical process, you know, to transform her black and white photographs into like watercolor, you know, like abstract um, images. So, um, the, I mean, and this is very, very, this, this is something that I really love, you know, like the moment where you actually meet uh, an artist and you, you, you have to build a sort of like a trust between you and the artist. And, and, and from that process, I don't know, something emerged. And I also, for me, like curatorial practice is not only about doing exhibitions, you know, it's actually, like I said, like dive into the archives, you know, like recovering material because I really believe that in the archives, in the, in the libraries, in these hidden boxes, the cardboard boxes, in the closets, are, you know, like traces or material that can reveal us a totally different art history. So I'm, I'm like constantly, you know, like um, doing that. I'm not a, 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 like a this kind of curator that I mean, I'm not good. At, I'm not good doing studio visits. You know, it's, it's, it, that's not my thing. I'm, I'm more like, you know, like uh, trying to find all art history books or all catalogs and trying to look for those, you know, like stuff that were hidden and also trying to understand why they are not we asked now, I mean, to, to understand why Victoria Cabezas, you know, even when she actually created this amazing number of work, because this is nothing, I mean, she has a number of brilliant works that were never exhibited, you know, why she is not part of the narrative, not, not only in Costa Rica, but, you know, like, in a broader sense. So what, you know, what this, um, what that says about our history, you know, about politics, about visual culture, about, about cultural infrastructure, um, so yeah, I, I, I agree with you. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's our responsibility as curators, you know, it's an ethical responsibility to actually try to not only work with the materials that we have, uh -huh, that exist already, but also trying to, um, yeah, trying to, to, to be honest about what we, 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 we felt that is urged to discuss, you know, and to invent also new ways to discuss about it. So, um, you know, for me, archival, uh, research and curatorial practice are like totally interwoven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the stories you had about the politics of preservation. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really um, vital. Um, yeah, so I think when, when we started working on the exhibition, I, for me it was really clear that I didn't want to do an exhibition that sort of reaffirmed the, the preconceptions or the, or the um, notions that existed about um, Western versus non-Western art practices. I mean, I thought that Guatemala is an incredibly, like, culturally incredibly complex and that its art production is a product of that. And that it was unfair to a large extent that if what we call contemporary art is so inspired and so infused by these other forms of cultural production, then leaving those those forms outside was um, was arrogant. It's saying like, you know, we 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 um, are inspired by this, but this is not art. And that was something that I'd always found incredibly problematic. I'm just gonna pull up the image because if there's something is that alright? Please. Because there's there's another work um, There's another work in that uh, in that space that I think further sort of explains this. And if you see that little cup in the middle, I don't know if you're familiar with that work, but it's a work by an artist called Dario Escobar, and it's a McDonald's cup that has been um, covered with gold foil and motives from the 
traditional sort of Baroque imagery. So it's this little like flowers and leaves and and like many of his works and the works of many other artists, I mean, they're really the, the, the product of, um, of this sense of cultural hybridity. And that cultural, cultural hybridity is, is produced by that class of worlds. And, you know, that's, I suppose, an entirely, a completely other conversation. Um, but that all of these things coexist, and coexist in, in a world that we call art. So the exhibition was wanted also to be sort of conscious of what was going on, on what have been the margins that are really not the margins. I mean, they're the margins for us wider people who live in the city and who go to contemporary art galleries, but they're not at the margins for, you know, the large of the population, 60% of the population is indigenous. So, you know, if we put out an exhibition that it's about Guatemala and contemporary art and leave these people out, it's, we should really be saying we're, we're putting up an exhibition of, of Western-centric, white Guatemala and contemporary art. And that was something that I really sort of wanted to stay away from. Um, and there's another, there's, oh uh, wait, there's, uh, there's another image that I wanted to show you here. This is another room that brings together words that are related to um, Lake Catitlan, which is a very, uh, sort of very touristy, very symbolic, very beautiful place in Guatemala City. And there's um, around the lake, um, there's lots of artists. Um, they're they're very sort of artistically effervescent and and prolific artistic communities. And the work you see on the right, which you can see only, I mean, a little distorted, but it's the first uh, night scene of Lake Atitlan done by an artist called Juan Cisai, who was also the first indigenous artist that started depicting the place he was living, not from a, um, not, not, not as a sort of inevitable condition, but really sort of being uh, appreciative and being conscious of the fact that that was also understood as, as a landscape. And the sort of consciousness about the contradiction between Landscape for some people and environment for others was something that I that I think it's um, it's it's seminal and it's essential not only in his own artistic practice but also in the understanding of the idea of landscape for a country like like Guatemala. So these contributions from these artists in other um, from these other traditions was something that needed to be a part of that. Yeah. Well, it's so good that you took us right to the images because, of course, my, in my memory of it, it had been. There were two works, and it was like you know almost as if it was a binary. And then you, of course, importantly brought in this third work and um, completely exploded the idea that that this was any kind of like um, opposition, which it never has been. Of course, these things are constantly in contact; they're mutually constituting each other at all times. So um, I'm really grateful to you for utilizing the visual evidence so accurately. Um, I wanted to ask both of you a question about the role of documentation or ephemera um, as um, paths to, to uh, not in, in lieu of art, but as like, um, or just how, how you use them as visual tools. Um, so I'm thinking, Miguel, of the queer show um, that you just, that you did very recently and almost salon style, you know, works that are really pieces, they're not works, you know, but things, stuff, stuff that's been generated out of a social movement, really, um, that was never destined for an institution, um, and how that, how you think about that, I guess, in the space of an art institution. Um, we also saw some works of Emiliano in your show, um, A History on the Corner, um, that, again, are documentation or journalistic um, archival images, but no, nevertheless, you're thinking about in a highly, you know, you're making choices about scale, you're making choices about juxtaposition. So, how, you know, the kind of complicated role that that kind of ephemera can play? Yeah. Well, um, well, in my case, I think it depends on the exhibition you're making, you know, right? So, sometimes you're making exhibitions that are entirely um, art exhibitions, uh, but, but exhibitions can be about, I think, infinite subjects and topics and, and there are a million ways of making an exhibition and that particular exhibition required those different levels and those different languages and those different um, types of materials and I think um, that that was absolutely necessary to tell the story because each language and its vocabulary is going to reach in a different way. Um, whereas in Guatemala from 33,000 for example I would not have dreamed of including 
um, things that work on art because you know the perspective was really that of trying to build and to create a history of, of art. So I think, I mean, I, I tend to be skeptical of documenting exhibitions because I think they're not easy to access, they're not easy to read and you can never sit down and read the book properly. Um, but I also think it's a way of presenting things to, to the world and saying like this, you know, this is a whole universe that you can go out and explore and it really depends. It's a sort of a, a compromise between the amount of information and the type of information and materials that you're presenting and making the exhibition um, uh, an interesting physical, architectural, timely experience for the viewer, which I think is ultimately our goal. I mean, I think if you make a super boring document dance exhibition, nobody's going to see it, and people are just going to leave, and then you're, you know, like, what's the point? You just make a book. Um, so it's, uh, it's something that you really have to think about carefully and say how far you can go in including these things that will still allow people to make sense of the entire experience and the discourse that you're putting together. Yes, I agree that you know it depends on uh, what kind of exhibition you are making, um, and it, it is not easy as you know. So it's, it's actually very complicated. You know, when I'm actually dealing with documenting an exhibition, I'm struggling all the time. You know, how to show it, how to communicate what they say, how to translate them. You know, like because if you are exhibiting, you know, like the Spanish uh, documents in an English-speaking country, you know, you have to, you have to translate. So it's quite difficult. It's not easy. Um, so, but I, I really, I usually, you know choose, you know, to face a kind of problem when I'm, when I'm showing uh, my projects because um, I'm trying to also to, 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 to put a number of questions about what, what, what is an, 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 a, a sensory experience or what is an artwork. So in the case of this queer exhibition that I, I, you saw that the images I, I, I presented, it was a collaboration with a queer organization, the Frente por los Derechos Igualitarios. Um, uh, so since the beginning, we, we decided to organize a sort of portable, you know, project that could travel. And uh, we also decided that we were going to, to, to make the exhibition using like domestic uh, materials, like the photographs and the documentation that actually the local activists had in their places. You know, like the, the, the photograph that they took like six years ago, the negatives, the, their, their flyers. So, uh, we were quite respect, respectful, you know, about, about the, the size and the scale of these documents, and also we decided that we were going to we'll, we, we decided to build a sort of timeline, you know, that started in, in the 1950s and ended now, like 2016, and trying to trace, you know, the different uh, uh, statements, declarations uh, in the form of quotes, like there were a number of quotes in the, in the walls alongside uh, photographs and, and, and documents and visual documentation from that moment. And also because we wanted to reconstruct, you know, the way these people actually felt um, what, what it was for them to be homosexual in the 50s, what it was for them to be a lesbian in the 60s, you know, like uh, being trans people in the 90s to be a sexual, I mean, we are actually trying to, to point uh, like uh, personal experiences, you know, and how can we actually transfer these experiences? We we were asking we, we asked also some uh, local activists um, to do uh, drawings. Uh, I don't know to, to create uh, visual representations, not non art in the sense that they were not, they, they were an artist. But how, how can they can I don't know, transform like the, their feelings in, into images? I mean, it was like an experiment. We didn't know how we ended. Uh, how we could end it. And I think it was really nice because what we wanted to show was a, a sort of open archive that you actually feel invited that if you have a, 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 I don't know, a t-shirt, you know, a hat, a, a, another photograph uh, to actually bring it. So we can actually construct these this, this walls together. So we, we organized a series of public talks, so it was, it was an excuse. And we were also trying to, yeah, to reimagine how, how, how can we build the exhibitions. I mean, not from, um, I mean, taking as a, as a starting point, as a starting point, uh, artworks, because we certainly could actually uh, narrate this history using artworks, but, you know, like using testimonies, you know, oral testimonies and experiences. 
So yeah, I think it's, it's, in, in each case is I mean it's, it's a different strategy, but I really love actually you know to be challenged for this kind of situation, and also to, to yeah to to to, to be enforced you know to, to invent like new 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 ways new devices to show what what, what which, which in many cases is very difficult to transfer you know experience. Maybe I'll ask one more question before we um, have other people join in, which is about the role importance of collaborative research, I guess, or how collaborative modes of working have played a role for both of you, and also it's how collective authorship can be such a problem in some ways for our understandings of, uh, you know, our the kind of monolithic understandings of the role of the author. It can be very, very difficult, I think, to surface the complexities of collectives and what they do. I mean, also, I'm just, I mean, I was talking to Patsy Valdez yesterday or right after the symposium that we and I were just at, and she was mentioning just how, you know, the um, difficulties around historicizing the group that she was in, OSCO, in the 70s and 80s in LA, and how the, what had began as a beautiful dream of collectivity has really soured and curdled into, you know, a big mess, <laughs> a big mess about ownership, I guess. So I'm just wondering if you might speak to the um, how collaboration has worked for you individually, you know, both of you in, in terms of your research, but also how collaborations sort of um, are made visible in your exhibitions. I mean, I mean, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's very complex, uh, and I actually been working, uh, doing research about a number of collectives. And all the time it's really difficult because, you know, most of them are like, um, they don't talk to each other anymore, you know, they have a fight in the 90s, and some of them, you know, they don't want to loan the, the work. I mean, it's, it is crazy, it is really crazy. And I, I, I organized an exhibition in 2000 and, um, that was 2013 at the Lima Museum about uh, a queer art collective that was active between 1982 and 1994 in Peru and in Germany. And they did the most amazingly transgressive, you know, profane sexual iconography that could exist in, in the middle of an extremely violent civil war between China and Bata, Maoist Communist guerrilla and the Peruvian state. And, you know, their, their work is, is, is unbelievably, you know, like, like it's a punch in your face, and because the way, because um, how do they use, um, um, how do they use uh, uh, religious iconography and political iconography, and, and actually uh, sh shows, you know, like the the links, you know, like the how can I say, this? like the complicity, you know, between religious uh, authorities in the war, in the crimes that were committed during that decade. So, you know, the, their work was exhibited once in 1984 at the museum. Uh, they, were, they were called, like, a number of names. Uh, they never exhibited her, their work after that. So, actually, they produced it in, in an isolated house in Peru, and they left in 1989 because of the political violence. So, they bring all the material with them, you know, if, the, the material that they actually couldn't pack, they burned it at the backyard, and they took the ashes, you know, like with them. So literally nothing left in Peru. So in 2008, 2009, I, I, when I moved to Europe, 2008 for studying um, at the Banca and as uh, in Chiba Grand, um, I started to visit them, uh, trying to actually recompose, you know, to, to create a, to create the conditions to show their work again Peru, because it was extremely important also because they introduced uh, you know, gender and sexuality in such explicit way, you know, like uh, uh, in order to actually rethink where the origins of the of the political violence. Uh, so I, I approached to the three of them independently and of course you know it was a huge fight and it was impossible. Um, I decided to, to show the work of one of them in Peru, uh, it was the archive, and after that, it, you know, it was such a mess because the other two members, uh, they were very angry, you know, and they actually sued him, you know, and the, 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 the situation, you know, is still ongoing, it is not solved, but we actually had the chance to, to show at least a fragment of this, and it was extremely important because um, he created a 
a public debate. Um, and it was funny because um, we, we showed this exhibition at the same time of losing the human form in Peru. We actually had the whole Lima Museum took with a number of very explicit political sexual images. And it, create, it contributed, you know, to create that critical public sphere. But as I, there is something I really, really appreciate about curatorial practice, you know, that you are actually contributing to create a critical debate about some issues that are, you know, constantly being erased on the collective, you know, conversation. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is, it is, it is still delicate. It is probably not familiar to deal with that. But I, but I, I believe also that. We, I mean, personally, because I'm being part of many art collectives, like students, organizations, and even curatorial collectives. So for me, it's extremely important, you know, to recognize and reflect collaborative practice as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a extremely, you know, political, fruitful, and extremely vital space for thinking and for producing and creating community, you know, of affect, affectivity, sociability. Yes. Oh, I agree. <laughs> I, I don't think I've had um, a lot of experience with collectives. I'm trying to think. I mean, I've always worked, I think, collaboratively in small groups. And it's always been really great. And I think it's really just a problem that we, as a, as, as a, as a human kind, are really a little like, silly and selfish and egotistical. And, and, stupid to be honest. And that tends to get in the way of like intellectual production which is a pity and I think it's unfortunately that's just humanity, you know, that's just how we are and I don't know if there are better ways of getting that together. I mean I also think that yeah it's really difficult because it's so personal, you know, the work what we work with is something that's so connected to what we believe in and, and all these things. It's so difficult to take distance from that, you know, and to give it up because we feel that we're giving up out of ourselves and all these things. But I really do think it has to do with that maybe in two thousand years if we're still alive and an earthquake having killed us or something like that, we you know our sense of like our our relationship with our ego and our, our relationship with others is going to be better. <laughs> really like annoying. <laughs> Progressive history. 
So that it seems to me that you know this question of theory and ethics is at the heart of what we both do in very different ways because we both uh, work with such different material and it, the interventions into the aesthetic field are so different. But I was just hoping that you could you could talk a little bit about this question of theory and ethics. Well, I'm going to just advance something very important, which in my case I think is very simple, and it's that to that combination of theory and ethics, I would also add uh, politics, mm -hmm. um, which is where, in my case, I think my ethics develop from. Mm -hmm. and it's uh, by exercising that, that ethical framework that, that I, I don't know if I was brought up with, or that I developed, or that I, mm -hmm. you know, sort of consider for a variety of reasons, um, that is correct or that should be correct. Um, and that is, I think, my way of applying that into what I do. And I think if you work in the arts and culture in general, uh, you're working with profoundly humane material. And that humane material should be really laid out on a structure and on a base that's um, just ethical, uh, that, it's really that it's sort of really powered by this sense of, uh, I'm not going to say equality, but I will say justice, and I will say, and that justice can take different from, so historical justice, so, uh, um, uh, recognition, you know, justice in terms of recognition, and legal justice, um, like in the case of Guatemala, that's a story worth it, you know, it is, it is really not just, in, not just that in a country where 60% of the population belongs to a certain identity, a, a form of understanding the world and a being also biologically, um, they have no access to any uh, system of uh, power, expression, recognition. Uh, and so I'm going to tell a, a story that is not about the majority. I know it just seems really contradictory. Um, and I think, I mean, uh, the, like the operating within the political for me it's really complex I mean I think it's really ambitious and it's really difficult and I really like admire the people that manage to do it in a, in a respectable way because everybody seems to do it really wrongly lately um, and I think when you speak of intervention then I think that is you know my the, the way that I have of introducing a voice into that conversation is, through the work I do, which is through the recognition of the cultural production of, not even recognition, I mean, just like, that's the thing that already thinking of a recognition is something that I think departs from like, a, from like a, a slightly arrogant non-position of like, I, uh, white man, I'm going to recognize your existence and stuff that, it's just creating scenarios in which we are participating in a more, normal way, I mean, I don't even want to say horizontal, or just, yeah, in, 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 a, in the way that we want to participate in that conversation, and I think, I mean, if we don't do that in the arts, then, you know, we're really, really mistaken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's nice that you actually mentioned the name of Theoretica, because it, 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 it means exactly that, it's actually like a a mix of theory, ethics, and aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And you know, personally, uh, for me, when I think about curatorial practice or, or my, my own practice, I'm always thinking about how to how to contribute to to construct or build infrastructure. I mean, for me, that's the key concept of everything. You know, and that means, uh, of course, creating conditions, you know, for preservation of documents. Material, like I said, you know, presentation. Um, that also implies to, to build collections, you know, like critically, critically, you know, that actually include, that, that could actually like um, force us you know, to discuss some issues that are, as I said, usually erased by conservative you know, ideas you know, in the public sphere. How can a collection can trigger a, 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 a critical political debate about our present? You know, how can participate, you know, like shifting or changing, you know, the way uh, we imagine ourselves as a, as a, as a social body, you know, as a society. Uh, it's also, it also implies, um, you know, like, uh, like the, the work we do in theoretical with the archive, you know, like how, how can we build a library or, or, 
or an archive and give public access to these materials. And public access is extremely important. Access, access in itself. You know? mm -hmm. Also publication. And I'm totally into publication because we really need to, yeah, to put these, these documents, this reflection, this idea in the hands of, you know, of everybody in order to, 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 to discover, you know, to, to, to rethink, to, yeah, I don't know, to, to question the, 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 the place we are um, located now. So, um, yeah, the infrastructure is always present for me. Mm -hmm. And I it's probably because I grew up in Peru, you know, when I actually decided to be a critic or curator or researcher, you didn't have any, any, any place to study, you know, that, so I actually have to, you know, like, it is like self-taught. I, 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 I was studying literature because I, I knew that I wanted to write, and I, mm -hmm. that's what I do, mostly writing. Um, but I have to actually, you know, like, uh, read and read and actually meet people and, and listen to, you know, what they have to say and learn working with them. So I, I'm, I'm, I would like, you know, to actually offer, uh, I don't know, like, a, a great, a different conditions because I really believe art is extremely important in, in the way we can, in, in the way we imagine democracy in itself. You know, visual representation is extremely important in, in the way they shape, you know, subjectivities and social behavior. So, we, when we're talking about representation, for me it's not only about art, it's about representation in the public realm. So, I'm, you know, always thinking about that. And also, curatorship for me is also, you know, the question about, um, um, what kind of um, what kind of value are creating? You know, because uh, what a curator does is creating value around something. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, how can we use our privilege, you know, and our cultural capital to create value around the stuff that would actually challenge, you know, the conservative consensus that, that we call, you know, like emerging. So th that's probably for me, like you know, the ideas that that actually are related with, um, with uh, theory and, and ethics. Let's continue the conversation over our reception, which is across the hall. Thank you all so much, and thank you to Emiliano and Miguel for getting kicked out of the room at 7.30, so we have to... <laughs>